Lord, open our hearts and our, our minds to hear what you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Today we are in Genesis chapter 15. And I want to talk about a walk of faith on how to live a big life. And the, and, and the story is about Abraham. And if you look at Abraham, when God called him and he was <coughs> in this place called Ur of the Chaldeans, which is very close to, to, to Babylon, which is uh, in Iraq, modern-day Iraq, Abraham was just an ordinary man. There was nothing extraordinary about him. And yet, when you look at his life story, and as we followed his story, we've seen that this ordinary man lived an extraordinary life. As I said, when God called him, there was nothing extraordinary about him. But this man ended up becoming the father of the faith. And what's awesome about him is this, is that uh, today, three of the largest uh, religions look at him as a key figure. Uh, and, and what that tells me is this, that he lived a big life. He lived a life of big faith. Uh, so if you go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, when God called him, God gave him a promise. In Genesis 12, verse 2 and 3, it says, And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God comes to this ordinary man and says, Listen, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Now, for those of us who understand what a great nation is, uh, there are some basics to become a nation. And here's this one man, and, and some of the basics is this. Abraham needed children. Without children, he's not going to become a great nation. And by this time, Abraham had no children. The second thing is Abraham needed land. Without land, you can't have a great nation. And by the time we get to Genesis 15, which is three chapters later and many, many years after Abraham has been called, about 20 years or so later, Abraham didn't have both. He didn't have, a great, he, he didn't have children and he didn't have land. His wife was barren. She was touching 90 by this time. And the land that he was supposed to have was occupied by Canaanites. So when we come to Genesis chapter 15, God comes to Abraham. And God tells him, Abraham, don't be afraid. I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And what's amazing is God comes to Abraham and says, don't be afraid. And he is the father of the faith. Obviously, for God to say this, Abraham was afraid. He was afraid because 20 years had gone by. He had left his home. He has left his family. He left everything to follow God. And time has gone by and nothing seems to be falling into place. If he was going to be a great nation as God had called him to be, he should have had children by now, and he has none. And his wife is as barren as the first day that Abraham heard the call. If he was going to be a great nation, he should have had a, a land for this nation to be in. And by this time, we know Abraham didn't have land. In fact, even when Abraham died, and his wife died. He just had land enough to bury, you know, be buried and, his, and to bury his wife. He didn't have a land even when he died, by the way. So Abraham is afraid. 
he's afraid he's coming on 100 and he doesn't have much life left and nothing has been achieved so he's afraid and in verse 2 and 3 in Genesis 15 but Abraham said Lord God what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Elias of Damascus. Then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. He says, God, you're telling me not to be afraid. But there are things to be afraid of. Because if I die today, there's no one in my lineage, my line, that can take my inheritance and live, my, and live beyond me. The only person that is next in line to taking over everything that I have up to now is a man from Damascus by the name of Eliezer, who is one of the, my servants in my home. Thank God. You're saying me, telling me not to be afraid, but there are things to be afraid of. I have no child. I have no heir. And in Genesis 15 verse 7, God says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit. And God says, listen, I'll give you a land. I'll give you this land. And I didn't just bring you up for nothing. But Abraham turns around to God in verse 8 and says this, and he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? How do I know? How do I know, God, you're going to keep your promise? How do I know anything of this is going to come to pass? How do I know these things? The two of the greatest challenges to our faith come from two questions. When you're called to serve God and follow God. And the first one is, how do I know God will fulfill his promises? How do I know? When I felt the call to, to give, it, give up everything to follow Jesus, as most of you know, it came in a two, kind of a two-stage process. First, God came and told me to give up my inheritance. And I remember going before God and saying, God, how will I survive? How will I educate my children? How will I do this? How do I know that? See, the Bible says, God is not a man to lie or a son of man to repent. What he said will he not do. What he has spoken will he not bring it to pass. And all that's great and wonderful. Yes, God is a God who keeps his promises. Wonderful. But how can I be faithful? How do I know I can remain faithful to God? My second biggest fear coming into ministry was this. What if I failed? What if I failed? You know, when I was called to to full-time ministry, honestly, it scared the living daylights out of me. Because for me, it's like this. If I was a member of the congregation, at least the way we think traditionally, even if I fail or falter or fall, it's not going to affect anybody. Nobody will really care. Nobody will really know. And if I'm doing some ministry, I can call my pastor and say, you know what, pastor, I'm, I don't feel I need to take a break. So I need some time off and just take some time off and nobody's going to be the wiser. But as a pastor, what do you do? What if you fail? What if you fall? Who do you go to? What do you do? You know, if I got annoyed with my pastor or didn't like the church I was going to, I can just go and find another church. There's so many down the road. But when you're the pastor, where do you go? What do you do if you fail or fall? Where are you going to go? What if you get annoyed? Where are you going to go? 
And that scared me. Abraham had this fear, so he goes to God and says, God, how do I know? And God says in verse 9, And the Lord told him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abraham presented all these to him and killed them. Then he cut each down the middle and laid the half side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. Some vultures swooped down to eat the carcass, but Abraham chased them away. What is God saying? He said, bring me a bull, a goat, and a lamb, and some birds. And Abraham knew exactly what to do with them. You don't see God giving any more instructions than that. He just said, bring them to me. And Abraham knew exactly what to do. Because Abraham understood what God was doing. God was going to make a covenant. So what did Abraham do? He slayed those animals. He cut them. And he spread them out like I showed you last time. So if you go to the next slide. So when covenants were made in the past, right, you and I sometimes don't understand covenant terminology and what covenants are. And that's why we think, you know, coming to Jesus and giving our life to him is kind of like a contract. But that's not what it is. It's a covenant. And in, in ancient times, when two kings made covenants, you have the two kings, and what they did is they brought a bull, and they brought a goat, and they brought a lamb, and then what did they do? They cut them, and they separated their pieces. Okay, next one. And the next. Yeah, not bad, right? Greatest uh, <laughs> cheerleader is. And then what they did is they made the blood part, a part of blood, and each of the kings walked through the part. And the next fellow as well. And they both had to do it. So God made a covenant. Now the question is this, very simply. How does covenant answer the questions? How do I know God will fulfill his promise? And how do I know if I can be faithful to the end? How does covenant answer those questions? And the first one, how do I know God will keep his end of the covenant or be faithful to the promise? To Abraham's question, how do I know God you will keep your promise? God says, let's make a covenant. And I want you to see in Genesis 15, verse 12, it says, as the sun was going down. Now, so Abraham did this, and darkness came, right? And, and it says, as the sun was going down, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a terrifying darkness came over him. Now, I want you to remember that, because we're going to, I'm going to remind you about this darkness later on. But for the moment, let's move on. And in verse 17, it says, After the sun went down and darkness fell, Abraham saw a smoldering firepot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcass. It's interesting. It says smoking firepot and a flaming torch. Right? The word for smoking is a Hebrew word, which is ashan, which is <coughs> not ashan. But it's spelled like Ashan, A-S-H-A-N, but pronounced with a W. And the flaming torch is the Hebrew word Esh. Now what's interesting is, in Exodus 19 verse 18, when the glory of God came upon Mount Sinai, it says Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. It talks about smoke and fire. And guess what these two words were? It's the same two words for the flaming torch and the, and, and the smoking, uh, you know, the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch. It's the same, same two words. So this, this fire pot and torch is God's glorious presence. And if you look at this again, you go to the next one. There's Abraham. Happy. And there the cow and the bull and the goat. 
Then God says, bring them, and then Abraham cuts them, and he puts them like that. Puts them like that. And then guess what happens? There was a flaming torch. Comes down. That. So quick you didn't even see it, right? But it went through, okay? The torch went through. What is awesome, friends, is, and sometimes this is why I said you don't understand covenant terminology, and the problem is we miss some of this. God walked through the path of blood. And why is this important? Why did they cut these pieces and put them on either side, and why did they walk through it? There's a hint of this in Jeremiah 34, verse 18. Jeremiah 34, 18, God is angry with his people because they have broken the covenant. And this is what he says in Jeremiah 34, 18, and I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant because they're breaking their marriage vows, they're breaking and, and using their power to, to uh, put people down and, and there's no justice in the land and God is angry with his people and he says, I'll give these men who have broken my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me, when they cut the half in two and pass between the parts of it. God says, I will do to you what you did when you cut those animals and walked before it. I'm going to do the same thing to you. I'm going to destroy you, is basically what he's saying. See, when you walk through those two parts, what you're saying is, if I fail to keep my covenant, then what happened to these animals, let it happen to me. Let me be slain if I don't keep the covenant. Now here's what's awesome, friends. What is absolutely awesome. When God passed through this, this aisle as such, what God was saying is, Abraham, I have promised to bless you. And through this blessing, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I promise to give you a land. I promise that you will become a great people. I promise that through you, salvation will come and you will be a blessing to the nations. And this is what God is saying. If I don't Keep my promise. Then let my immutability become mutation. Let my immortality become mortality. Let my infinity suffer limitation. And may my power suffer powerlessness. And may I be cut off. This is God. He's saying, if I don't keep my promise to you, then let me, who's God, this infinite, eternal God, he's saying, then I will be cut off. In other words, friends, he's saying, I cannot break my promises to you. Isn't that awesome? That is why Abraham could trust God. Such, in such a way that when God, a few chapters later, comes and says, Abraham, sacrifice your son. And I like the way God says it. I mean, it's almost like God is rubbing it in. He says, sacrifice your only son, the one you love, to me. And what does Abraham do? He doesn't even think twice. He takes this son up the mountain to sacrifice him, Mount Moriah to sacrifice. Why is that? Because Abraham knew Isaac was a son of blessing. And there is no way that God is going to destroy this boy. Because according to his promise, he would even raise him from the dead. Isaac knew that. Because God had made a covenant. And God had walked between these pieces in the very presence of Abraham. Abraham saw something, friends, that lots of people would never see in their lifetime. The only time was a few thousand, thousand years later, another group of people saw a similar thing. It was absolutely awesome. 
And that is why he was able to hope against hope. Because he saw God make a covenant with him. In Romans 4, 18 to 22, it says, Who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform Therefore, it was accounted to him as righteousness. Abraham looked at his own body and said, listen, I'm almost 100. I think I'm, I'm way over, you know, being able to have kids. And then he looked at his wife and he said, she is almost 90. I mean, th there's no way that she can have kids. You know what? God made a covenant. And God cannot break that covenant. Therefore, I trust. Look at this, Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. And 18 and 19 also. It says, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Isaac, Abraham said, listen, you know, even if I... Sacrifice Isaac today. God said it's through him that the nation will be born. And therefore, even if I sacrifice him, God has to bring him back to life because God made a covenant. Friends, when you understand covenant, you understand one thing. That we have a God who does not break his promise. Abraham understood if God could commit himself, if God could commit himself and humble himself to walk between these cut pieces on this blood-soaked path, if God could do that, there is nothing stopping God from being faithful to his promise. when you understand covenant friends you understand God's promises are yea and amen how do I know that I will remain faithful to the covenant how do I know that I will not fail you know God says you will be my people and I will be your God okay that's awesome But how do I know I can remain faithful to this God? Because I know I will let him down. And I know because of the many times that I let him down, what if God gets tired of me and says, you know what, enough of this guy. He's failed me too many times, I better pick somebody else. I want to go back to the covenant part. When Abraham cut these pieces, remember I told you when there are two kings or two people make a covenant, who walks between the two parts? Who walks? Both of them. Go back and read Genesis 15. Who walked in this path? Let's see. Next. There is Abraham. I just keep putting this up because I took a lot of time and I want you guys to see this many, many times over. Yeah. Okay, so who is walking between this part? Okay, next. Yep. What's happening? Oh, there he goes. What's Abraham doing? He's just on the side watching this. God didn't call him to walk. Abraham didn't walk that path, by the way, friends. It was only God who walked that path. God didn't call Abraham to walk it. And this is what is astonishing about what happened here. Because whenever a covenant was signed by two people, both parties walked it. But listen, this is what's even more astonishing. 
that whenever a covenant was signed, the great, greater king, either he also walked the path, or he got his inferior, or the king who was subordinate to him, to walk the path. It was always the inferior person who walked the path. Because the inferior person would say, I am making a promise to you that I will keep my part of the bargain. So if I conquered you, and I said, right, we are going to make a covenant, and this is the covenant, that you will always give your, you know, give me a portion of your wealth, whatever, and you will keep this path open, and you will fight wars when I come to battle, that you will come and support my army, all that. I will do this and get you to walk through it. But it's in, what is astonishing is that Abraham, the lesser person in the covenant, did not walk. It was only God who did it. This is a unilateral covenant, by the way. God is saying, Abraham, I did not ask you to walk this path. Because I will be strong enough for the both of us. I will fulfill your righteousness. All you have to do is trust me. I'm going to walk this path for the both of us. This is the gospel, by the way, friends. The salvation in the Christian faith is not a corporate effort. You and I are not called to die for our sins. God died for our sins. Christian salvation and the gospel message is not God helps those who help themselves. It's not a partnership. If you do your part, then I will do my part. No, no. And this is why many people misunderstand the gospel message. And they get caught up in a struggle and striving to prove their worth and prove their goodness to this God. And you know what happens to most people? They follow one of two pathways. The first is they try and try and try to keep the law and the commandments and be this good person. And they fail and fail and fail and they come to a point of saying, I can't do this. So you know what? I would rather go and live in the world then try to be someone that I, 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 I'm failing. I can't do this. You know what the other part is? That you keep a few things that you're good at keeping. And then you look at those who are not keeping those. And say, you know what? Look at me. I'm better than these guys. And you become self-righteous. And these are the two pathways that many people take because they don't understand the true gospel message. God didn't say, okay, I will send my son to die on the cross, but you also must climb on the cross and die with him. See, it was Jesus who died. And you know what we, you and I have to do? We have to believe. And the Bible says that Christ died for us while we were sinners. Ultimately, friends, God took upon himself of a broken, upon himself the curse of the broken covenant. Jesus didn't die on the cross because God failed to keep the covenant. Jesus died on the cross because we failed. The descendants of Abraham failed. So by going through these cut pieces, God is saying, I'll bless you. Even if it means that I have to take the punishment of a broken covenant on myself. This is your God, friends. Centuries later, Mark 15, 33 says, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Remember I told you to remember the darkness that came upon Abraham? 
Here's another time darkness came. Look at verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was cut off. Isaiah 53, 8 says, My oppression and judgment he had, was taken away. And as for his generation, who consider that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. God is saying, you failed the covenant, so I take the punishment. Because I am the one who walked through the path. Friends, do you understand how awesome he is? See, when you don't understand that, you, we are, you and I are trying to do, you know, be good and righteous and we fail. When you don't understand, you think you can take everything he did for you for granted. And he who says, don't trample the blood. Either we take it, and, 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 and take the sacrifice and, and think like nothing's happened. Or we take it and understand what he did. And I tell you, every time you look at the cross, it should break your heart. But it also should make you be in awe and wonder that a God could do this. Almighty God could do this. See, we don't understand covenant language. And that's why we look at this and think, oh, Abraham made a covenant with God. Oh, great, wonderful. No, no. God went through that pathway. And several centuries ago, it was God who died on the cross for our sins. The eternal God died. He was cut off. The darkness came down on him. And friends, this is why you can trust this God to keep you till the end. If he said, okay, I will do my part, if you do your part, then we can't trust if I will ever be faithful to God till the end. I can't trust if I will fail him and I will lose my salvation and go to hell or whatever else. And this is why Paul says in Philippians 1.6, being confident of confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ and you know what Paul is saying here he's saying I have such confidence in my God who can keep me till the till the end the same God I'm confident can keep you as well that's what he's saying he's not standing and saying look at me I'm so good that I'm so confident that God can keep me. He's looking at a people who are failing. He's looking at a people who are struggling to live right. And he's saying this, I'm confident God can keep you too. I'm confident this God who died on the cross for our sins and took the punishment for our evil and our transgressions, he can keep you till the end. So very quickly, how does this apply to me? How do you live like Abraham? Because he was an ordinary man who lived an extraordinary life because he understood what God had done for him. He believed the Lord. He believed is what the Bible tells us. Because he saw what God had done. So what are you and I to do, friends? Look at the cross. See what Christ has done for you. And by the way, if Abraham was astonished and what God did in the presence of Abraham was so amazing, let me tell you something. The new covenant is far greater than the covenant that God made with Abraham. Hebrews 8, 6 says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. So how do you know God is going to keep his promise to you? How do you know? 
because he made a covenant with you as well. It's called a new covenant. Remember this, friends. I want you to understand something. Hebrews 9, 16 to 18. Friends, I want you to understand this because you know what? There are some of you who are always doubting God. You're always doubting whether he'll come through for you. You're always doubting, will God fulfill his promises to me? You're always doubting God. You're living in such... Uh, and let me tell you something. Whatever sin that you and I commit comes from one place. Not trusting God. Go back and look at whatever sin you're committing. And it comes from the place of not trusting God. Hebrews 9, 16 to 18 says this. For where there is a testament. Testament means covenant. It's another word for covenant. There must also of necessity be the death of the testator. The one who signed the covenant needs to die. For a testament is in force after men are dead. Since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Now let me quickly ex explain this to you. Probably Jana Prith will be able to do a better, better job on this. If I write my last will and testament, and in it I put that when I die, that my house goes my son. Okay, don't let the other one hear this. <laughs> He's going to say, you said it on, on, on tape now. No, I'm just saying this is just a story. This is not my last will and testament. Okay, And I have a lawyer in here as well, so it's not going to work. And I say, I'm giving him the house. As long as I'm alive, that house does not belong to him. It belongs to me. But the day I die, he gets the house. Am I right? Yeah. And that's exactly what this is saying. So Abraham looked at better promises. And the Bible, Jesus said, he rejoiced when he saw my day. But you and I don't have to look to a future for better promises. Because Jesus has already died. So the promises of God, the covenant promises of God are yours today. It is in effect in the here and the now. You don't have to wait for something to happen. Abraham and the, and the saints of old all looked forward to a day that God himself will come and take upon himself our sin and our transgressions, and bring about the promises in our life. But it's already happened. And that is why in 2 Corinthians 1, 19 to 20, it says, For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas, Timothy, and I preach to you. And as God's ultimate yes, He always does what He says. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ. With a resounding yes. And through Christ, ah, amen. Amen. You know what the word amen means? And where it comes from, the word amen actually comes from amen. It's a Hebrew word. And you see this word, what, where it's derived from in Isaiah 22, 23. It says, I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place. Do you know the word secure there is the word amen. Or aman, which is where amen is derived from. And basically what it says is like a tent peg that is securely fastened to the ground, to the rock or whatever underneath is. It's fastened to the ground. That when the wind blows or whatever happens, the tent is secure. It's saying, Amen gives you, makes the promises of God for your life secure. Amen is a statement of faith and trust in God. It means truly, truly is where it's also translated as Amen, Amen. And what it means is this what God has said to me is truly, I believe it, Amen. And friends, let me tell you something. By now, if you don't trust the promises of God for your life, you have no understanding of covenant and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, finally, what about if I fail? Romans 5, 8 to 11. 
Remember, Jesus died for you while you were sinners. So how much more will he do for you now that you're a child of God? And listen to Romans 5, 8 to 11 says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of Jesus, uh, his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Certainly, it says. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. There is hope for us because Jesus died and made a covenant with us. I don't have to struggle along the way in fear. I don't have to worry about what if I fail. You know why? Because God is working in me to do His will for His good pleasure. Philippians 2, 12 to 13 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But listen to verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God is working in my life, friends. And yes, there are times I feel weak. And yes, there are times I fail. But no matter how much I fail and weak, the power of his presence, the power of his spirit is working in my life to make me more and more like Jesus Christ. Why is that possible? Because of the covenant. Because I'm a covenant child of God. I have the Holy Spirit, which is the seal of that covenant in my life. Now, let me tell you something, friends. If I'm always the same horrible person every day, then I need to make sure, am I truly a covenant child of God? Because the Bible says, when the power of God is in you, you change from glory to glory. None of us are perfect. But we are on a journey. A journey of perfection. To become more and more like Jesus. Your spouse, your children, your neighbors... Your office workers should look at your life and say, you know what, you're a better person than you were last year. Because God is working in you. Now, if that's not happening, then you need to truly question and ask yourself, is God in me? Okay? But that's what a Christian life is all about. And that's the confidence we have. Friends, when you have this confidence of a God who did that much for you, you should live a life that is full, a life victorious, a life that is great, a life that is big, like Abraham. We are all ordinary people, but we have called to live extraordinary lives. Let's pray. Father, we come before your throne of grace. Lord, I thank you, Father, that you're the God who made a covenant with us. And Lord, you look at us and see our frailty. You see our weaknesses. You see, Lord, how unable we are. And you say, you know what? I will walk the path. And I will help you fulfill it. I'll walk you through. I will walk with you. I will walk for you. You died in our place. Lord, I can't see such an amazing thing, Lord. I can't imagine such an amazing thing. The God of the universe who holds the universe in the palm of his hands where every atom, where every cell, where every minute thing is held together by your word, and yet you would do this for us. Lord, help us never to doubt you. Lord, yes, there may be times we get discouraged. Yes, there may be times that we have, we might falter. But on the whole, Lord, let us never doubt you. 
Let us never doubt that you're a God who will fulfill his promise to us. And Lord, let us never doubt that no matter how frail and, and feeble we are, that you are a God who's committed to us, committed to complete the work that you have started in us. And for that, Lord, I just want to thank you and I want to praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.